and we are underway for, for Feb. So, Robbie, we were thinking about um, waiting until after Premier, but a lot's been happening. Matthew and myself went on a little voyage. I've got four hats here, and I'm going to switch between them. Um, this is a little Avondale hat. Uh, you've been to Cracker before, Robbie. The, probably the most amazing thing about that complex is, is how every single uh, vendor has their own little tent. And look after Sorry, Corey, it. every single vendor has what to protect? As a little tent, and yes. a little hospitality tent. Yes, and they're underwater this year, correct? They were underwater, but they were pretty good, Matt, weren't they, in terms of looking after us? I mean, we didn't buy any horses, so Matt, yeah. you might want to talk us through that. So we went over there on a voyage and came back with, with zero horses. It was pretty tough over there to, to find the ones that we liked. Yeah, we didn't. We weren't successful in terms of buying horses, but we managed to make a lot of connections. Corey meets a lot of good people, and uh, hopefully, we've uh, broadened our network for next year when we go there, and people are more familiar with us, and we can have a bit more luck. Um, they were very uh, hospitable, the, the Kiwis, and the complex is outstanding. One of the best complexes in the world. So it was a very good experience. Besides uh, losing my luggage and landing up in Christchurch, yeah, have you had any luck with that luggage, man? No, no, no luck. It is a great, it's a great complex though, isn't it? Like to to look at horses and everything. It is a yeah, it's, yeah, it's one really of the best complexes I've been to in the world, 100%. It's funny, Robbie, before Matt went away to New Zealand, Monique said to me he's had a lot of baggage lately and so finally, <laughs> he, got, finally he got rid of some. I'm rid of my baggage. So, um, Robbie, obviously you've been to New Zealand before, but we did go there with a... A specific goal we weren't really looking at everything in terms of you know if we could buy the same type of horse in english premier which is our major sale we we didn't really steer towards those ones and we were looking for a specific derby and oaks type and funnily enough with all the aussie buyers and the asian buyers back at caraca they were all on the same lots yeah well i mean the fact that we didn't come home with anything is not a bad thing because it just means that we're sticking to a strict criteria and um and we want to make sure we get the right horses for our owners. And uh, if we didn't get them, we'd better off coming home empty-handed than coming home with uh, lesser than what we want to set out to achieve. So anyway, it is what it is. But uh, this year, you know, some of the horses that, um, you know, we searched for over there that you guys were working hard to achieve uh, didn't quite make the A-list or, you know, were too expensive or the mums weren't good enough or they didn't reach the the staying mould or whatever the case is. And plus on top of that too, English have really upped the ante on the Kiwis with all that extra money for the uh, English wins. So they had some pretty stiff competition this year, the Kiwis. Yep. And um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to run through the Magic Million stuff, uh, that we, the horses we bought, the classic as well. And then we're going to, the main part of it will be English Premier. But Robbie, uh, Quite a sad week for yourself, and I know it's it's a tough one to talk about, but I just wanted to make sure that we did mention it, and I'll leave this bit to you to, to do the right tribute here because you were closest to him. Um, but obviously, Dean Lester, and obviously a lovely photo there of you guys celebrating the group one with the quarterback. Um, I mean, you've been on the radio and TV all week talking about all of his strengths, and I mean... It's hard not to admire the man, but I'll let you sort of explain to everyone your relationship and the significance. Yeah, well, we've been mates. You know, he's like a brother to me, and um, we've been in our lives for the 38 years since we were young uh, teenagers, uh, making our making our uh, a fist of our opportunities in racing. Uh, me as an apprentice jockey and and Dean trying to break into the ranks that he ended up breaking into. And uh, so to grow up together, there was a group of us, myself and Dean, Simon Marshall, Ivan Culliver. And then, you know, along the way, there was sort of Peter Mertens and Luke Curries and and all the different sort of um, journey that we all sort of joined together. So to grow up um, together and you end up sort of like brothers and, um, and to see him, his career evolve sort of... Uh, parallel with uh, with myself and me going down the training ranks and him going down the journalist and tipster and analyst. And and we really sort of not just become like brothers, we also could bounce things off one another and, um, and our businesses and uh, abilities and all the things that you talk about could really assist one another, you know, from 
clocking the horses to analysing the form, it would really help one another's, uh, you know, uh, move forward, you know. So so then along the way, you know, um, all of those things rolled into one. We just had an absolute wonderful journey from driving the races to winning races to here, to, here in that photo, winning the, with the quarterback. And, and we actually trained uh, the, his grandmother, and uh, there's a story to that too. So to finally... Um, lose him at the tender age of 54, um, like my brother 54 in the one year, eight months ago. But one thing I can say, they packed 108 years of excitement in those two together. So um, yeah, very tough, very tough uh, week, but uh, he wouldn't want us to, um, he wouldn't want us to be sombre. He'd want us to to celebrate um, because that's how he was incredibly brave. So um, yeah, it's going to be tough on Friday when we, when we actually say goodbye to him, but uh but yeah, it's a tough week, Corey. Yeah, and um, I've got some nice footage from Trent Langscale, which I put up on our socials of of Dean actually celebrating the back's win, and obviously it meant a lot to him. And and you see in the photo there, Craig Pierce as well. So, I mean, it's a pretty long-standing relationship between everyone there, and he's linked uh, also to Jai McNeil. So I know it was an emotional race one at Flemington on Saturday, and you were hoping to get the Daily Bugle over the line, but if, if we couldn't win, then it was mm. fitting that Jai one. Um, and funnily enough, I went through our stats just to see um, how they sat. And Jai McNeil has the best return on investment of any jockey in our stable. So from over 200 odd rides for us, you'd return 4% on your investments if you, if you back Jai. So it's almost as good as the stock exchange. <laughs> well, there you go. We're going to try and get him on some more, but uh, yeah, no, he's well. Actually, he, we sort of dry cut his teeth, so to speak, on having his opportunity at. Uh, I think his first stakes winner was in uh, from our stable, and he uh, Dean said to me early days, he said, "This young fellow at uh, that's apprentice to Gerald Egan, he's he's going to really make the grade." So we started utilising his services as a three kilo claiming apprentice, and then one thing led to another, and he ended up. Uh, really doing well for us and then he rode a stakes winner for us and then he was away and running and you know now he's a Melbourne Cup winning jockey and such a wonderful young man that he is he deserves every success that he's got but it was through you know Dean recognizing his talent and then people like us and and others a lot of others not just us but you know giving him these chances and Prem always rises to the top you know so people like Joy uh, and Dean and they they rise to the top. Yeah, and uh, sorry, it was 461 rides, 4.3%. So I just thought it was fitting to bring that up with yourself and Jai. I thought Dino would have had a fair part of a lot of those returns. Yep, I'm sure he capitalised on them along the way too. So, all right, as you said, he would want us to move move forward yep. and soldier on. So let's go straight in here. So I'll change my cap now because obviously we've had a bit of success, um, Matt. Recently with Kia Ora, um, with our schnitzel filly. I know she didn't come from Magic Millions, came from Inglis. But we might, before we get into the magics, we, we might be a breaking story with Sarah Sana live on our webinar. So not yeah, good news, is. not going to the Diamond. No, nah, she's not going to the Diamond. She's going to have a little rest. Um, it's a war of attrition when you're getting ready for rests like the Blue Diamond and the Golden Slipper. But it's still very early in her career. And. She's a smart filly. Uh, we started off, you know, the, the last two months having about five young horses that we were thinking could make the grade. Um, but unfortunately, they, they're young horses and uh, they, they didn't stand up to the rigorous uh, demands of being ready for the Blue Diamond. But we're still excited about what the future holds because we had five, five horses about a month, month, six weeks ago that are high class animals um, that we're going to have a lot of fun with once they mature and develop. So... Lots to look forward to. Yeah, and Robbie, you've seen it a million times before. Um, obviously, these two-year-old races, you need everything to be perfect in a preparation. And if it's not, I know speaking to you guys now for the two years I've been there, basically, if it's not perfect, you'd rather put them away and make sure that they get every chance as a, as a late two-year-old or an early three-year-old rather than pushing them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, I think there's 2,000 entries for the Blue Diamond and you're lucky to have a full field of 16. So it is a race of attrition because um, it's a time of the year where the weather's at its warmest, daylight's at its longest, so horses are growing. 
And uh, when they're growing, the bones are at their softest and tracks are at their firmest. So it's a really bad recipe for horses to stay sound while they're growing. Um, so all the growing pains, bone soreness, shin soreness, all those things come into play. So that's why it's very hard to get, you know, 16 um, holding together, you know. So, um, you know, you, you listen to, you know, Mick Price on the radio the other day saying that Charm seen um, the filly there is going to the paddock for the same reasons and so many horses. So a lot of the horses that turn up on the day, it's whoever turns up not shin sore and not growing and things like that that predominantly runs so well. Um, if Mother Nature had um, the opportunity to program two-year-old racing, that all race, the Blue Diamond would be running to the June, July, you know. But that's that's part of the, I suppose, romance, or maybe maybe that's not the right word, but that's part of the difficulty and, and romance of trying to win it, is that it's at a time of the year where it's difficult. So the long story short is you can't afford to um, look up, you can't afford to put your horses under too much pressure. If they happen to get there, great. But if not, tuck them away because they'll come back a really good horse in the spring, you know. She's very, very talented. We know that. So once she grows, she'll be perfect in the spring. And talking of good horses, the first sale of the year up on our screen, Magic Millions. We came away with a Blue Point filly. She sold. A Brutal filly. She sold. We managed to get a Fast Net Rock Colt that reminded you, Robbie, of Glenn Fiddick. He's very close to being sold. We bought the first daughter of Fidelia in the first crop of Piratas. So she's, I believe, sold potentially. So she's 50-50, not much left. Uh, we got, bought a Zusane Colt, uh, which is a half to Bella Bella, Group 1 family. Uh, we bought a Shala filly that's very closely related to Sarasana. And we bought the half-sister by Heroic Valor to Michelotti, who was in the stable. So I'll start with you, Robbie. Pretty happy. Yeah, well, the theme there is um, all these uh, purchases are uh, extremely well related on the female side. I mean, the, the stands don't really need a, a great deal of, deal of introduction, um, but the most common theme that you'll see with all of our purchasing is that uh, the performance of the mayor um, and uh, both on the racetrack and their family. So uh, the fast net rock is... Um, Mum is a very good producer in uh, very bubbly in the stable. Jump the broom, just got group performances the the other half, and it's from the family of Group One horses in Lucky Bubbles in the uh, in the uh, Hong Kong as Group One winner. So Fast Net Rocks a superstar. He's had fifteen group horses, and that that horse looks just like Glenn Fiddick. So Matt and I loved him. He just looks like a an instant success. That horse, so he's a beauty. You know, the Suzanne's a half to a Group One winner already, and. The Paradas, um, you know, uh, out of Fidelia, who's a group, should have probably been a group one, and Typhoon Titmus is upgrading the family and the grunt that Matt and I love. And and the theme goes on and on and on. So that's the theme of all the horses that we've purchased thus far, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, exactly, Robbie. And uh, we're quite excited. And uh, luckily, Corey uh, came across there. Uh, lots to be positive about. Yeah, I mean, there's Matt. 1,200 horses, Corey, at the sales, and there's about, you know, 10% of the catalogue that's going to be uh, Saturday winners, your group, you know, your list of group three, group two, you know, so we try to leave 90% behind and concentrate on that 10% um, that are going to be the good ones. And um, naturally you can't afford to buy them all, but these horses after lots and lots of work fall into that category. So if, you know, if everything goes well moving forward, these are the sort of horses that are going to be the good ones. And that's why, that's why we've uh, purchased them, you know. Yeah, and Matt, I guess that a lot gets said in, I know in our social media and a lot of my marketing on the horses are often around, you know, we trained something in the family or we, or for example, the zoo saying half to Bella Bella, group one. So, you know, it's all based around this is what's in the family. I guess for those that might be following, what's the significance there? Why do we look like, I know in New Zealand, that was one of the reasons why we probably had a really short shortlist. Um, what's the significance of, of the, the idea to look for group performed families? Well, you're just putting the odds in your favor, Corey. You know, if, you, if you're if you buying horses that are bred out of excellence, then you're putting the odds in your favor to have a good horse. You, it's, already, it's already hard enough when less than 5% of the, of the population are, you know, stakes great. 
um, it's really hard enough to find that. So you may as well be shopping from that 5%. If you're shopping from the 95%, you, you know, you're making life very difficult for yourself. So that's why we try and be really fussy about what we buy. Yeah, yeah. All right, move on from magics. We also went to classic, Robbie. So it might have flown under the radar of a few people because English classic is probably not as promoted down here as Magic Millions and the English Premier. Um, but we bought two really nice horses, obviously Blue Point and Zusane. We fell in love with both of their progenies at the Gold Coast and we managed to land a Cult by Blue Point and a Zusane at Philly. Yeah, well, same theme again. Um, Blue Point, you know, unknown stallion, but got all the right credentials, the blood, um, his progeny, his sire line, and that sort of blood has worked very, very well in Australia. And uh, he's got the right credentials, winning um, all the Group 1 races that we've seen uh, our horses go and contest. And more importantly, won them as an older horse. So he shows that he's got a bit of substance to train on, not just an early early horse that sort of was a flash in the pan. So we think that he's uh, – and he produces a beautiful specimen, Blue Point. Uh, he's out of a good mare that we trained. She won seven. It's hard to win seven anywhere, but – you know, six of her wins were all Metro and group races. So she was a, a high quality mare um, out of a great family. You talk about win rate, you know, Deja Blue's mum was eight foals, seven winners. And, and that theme went right through, you know, 30 years of uh, of history. So history repeats itself. As Matt was saying before, you got to put yourself in that 5% minority of success. So these horses tick those boxes. And he's a mag magnificent looking specimen and he's got beautiful muscle tone, you know. So, and the Suzanne was much the same, you know. We're very impressed with the Suzanne. Matt and I, every time we pulled out a nice horse, well, geez, th these are just like the zoo stars. And once again, um, out of a Sepoy mare, Sepoy's going to be a good broodmare stand. And that's a lot, same sort of shape as Divine Quality. And that one's mum's a, a half to a group one performer. So, like Matt was saying before, the same theme applies, you know, we, we're we not buying a uh, mass amount of horses, um, so we're buying a select group, so there's plenty of room for us to shop in that in that sort of 5 to 10% of the, the catalogue and really refine what we do and these horses well and truly fit into that. And they're very, very affordable given all the bonuses, which you might want to uh, explain or Matt can explain some of those bonus schemes with the bonus and when you tally it all up, these horses are pretty much running they win one, they, they pay themselves back, you know. You can yeah, explain so some of those bonuses. There's a million-dollar bonus series now for Maidens, which Inglis has just bought out. Uh, that's on top of their race series. Um, and obviously their race series has got $4 million races and they're restricted to Inglis. Um, also the ladies' bonus, um, if you happen to have a ladies' bred horse. So to be honest, for us, Buying with Inglis makes a lot of sense because you have the option of a quick return. Um, and I mean, obviously, our stable's not solely around quick return. We buy horses of all types, but these two in particular are bred to be pretty sharp. The Zusane filly is actually a half to uh, Tarabu, who ran in the Blue Diamond preview, uh, sorry, preview and led most of the way. And I've heard that Gay Waterhouse is now, they're, they're looking at gelding that horse and bringing him straight back into work towards the slipper, whether he gets there or not. I mean, obviously they have an opinion of him. Uh, and then the mum is a half to a horse that came second in the Blue Diamond. So certainly she's bred for speed. So Matt, I guess the, the chances, like you said, you you minimise the risk and you give yourself a better chance of of success. Yeah, and uh, I'm really excited about these two sires and uh, like Blue Point for me since I've been in Australia, the progeny that we pull out of the boxes at the sales. Every single time that something comes out, you your eyes just pop out your head. There's so many nice looking Blue Points. So I don't think we can get enough of them. Um, so I'm really really excited. He's got a fantastic opportunity in Australia to make it as a good sire. And Zeus saying they look nicer than the Zoo stars. So if that's anything to go by, then they're going to be very exciting too. They look early, but also with a touch of class. Yeah, and obviously Zeus saying standing at Widen, so they would know a good Zoo star, I would imagine. So, and Blue Point, 
one of the world's best racehorses. So, um, by the way, guys, if you have any questions specifically about uh, any of them, then feel free to jump in. I've just got a question here, Robbie, uh, from an anonymous attendee, but just asking about colts and stallions and how you can keep colts basically with their manhood and keep them as stallions so they don't, you know, how, how do you keep them from becoming too sexual and you know obviously you can't give horses drugs or anything like that like you might for a human but um but basically you know how do you try and keep them behaving so they don't need to be gilded um it's it's a tricky one it's a you can manage them to a point you know you can keep them you know have cult barns and keep them in a boys barn away from the girls and things like that um but that's about as much as you can do because it's a little bit of a self-answered question, that one, because in the same question, it's, you know, understanding you can't use um, medicines to help. And in the days gone by when you could, uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the management was to use, you know, female hormones or some type of, some type of uh, you know, some type of medication to restrict the uh, amount of testosterone being produced to try to, to try to keep their manhood chemically down a bit, but that's not allowed anymore. Plus, there was a few uh, medications that were stopping the production of the testosterone, which was causing their testicles to shrink and was causing infertility. And there was some lawsuits and all sorts of things like that. So, with that happening, uh, that all was uh, uh, went pear shaped. So, the long and short of it was, I think you just need a bit of luck, you know. Simple as that. If they're gonna if they're gonna stay calm, they just will. And those that don't end up being gilded because they lose form and nobody wants to go to a stay in out of form anyway. So I think you can only do so much, you know. Yep. And up on the screen now, what do these horses have in common? Any guesses, Robbie and Matt? Uh they all were purchased from Melbourne Premier Sales. Anything else? They're all good horses. From... <laughs> What's that? What was They're that, all good man? horses. They are all good horses. So we've got the Goo Goo there, 65,000, Melbourne Premier. Um, the quarterback, what would that cost you, Robbie? 120. 120. Daily Google, 160, I think. Is that right? Yeah, he was two, 260, I think he was. 260. Uh, Angelic Light? She was 30,000. Yep. And Hard Squeeze? It's 80. Yeah, so and I've all gone on and, and raced at a minimum city. I just slapped those ones up there, but um, that leads us into the next part of it. So I'll change my hat to a grunt cat, Robbie, because last year we bought a grunt colt. And he's How many hats have you got? I've got a few here. I wear a lot for this stable, you know. So <laughs> just, um, I've got a I've got a trapeze artist one, but we haven't got one of those yet. So that'll be the final one. We need to try okay. and get ourselves a trapeze artist. Um, but I've got a grunt cap. We yeah. last year we bought a a grunt colt, yep. and we paid three hundred thousand. And people sort of thought that's a lot for a grunt. Um, yep. But he is a half to Typhoon Titmus, yes. and he looks pretty smart. One would say. Yes, we think that uh, from what Matt and I've seen, we think he's he's the money's been very well spent. We're very impressed with him. Um, you know, he, he's another one, like we were saying before about Sarasana going to the paddock. He was all dressed up, ready to go, as the saying as the saying goes. And um, but sh but shin soreness stepped in, or bone soreness stepped in, and um, he was supposed to go to the um, preview and went to the paddock. But in saying that, it was a bit of a surprise because he's uh, his dad was a three year old and his mum was a three year old and the whole family's three year old. So we were getting a little bit of a surprise that he was running or looking like running it too. But he's a beautiful colt, and we think that uh, he's going to do very, very well. So um, yeah, we're quite impressed with the grunt stock, actually. We've got a couple of them that are shaping up really well. Yeah, I think we've got some nice ones that have come out of that sale soon. Matt, um, there's a few that are in the stable at the moment, actually, that we got from the sale. So we have the Morden Reddies that we picked up quite, quite cheap last year. And they're both looking pretty nice. Um, any others that are standing out? Yeah, Celestial Storm. She's uh, flying the flag very well. She ran third at Sandown last Wednesday, beaten by two very smart Colts. So 
uh, and she was, uh, I think she was fifth at Flemington in November in uh, Ottawa. So she's a very smart filly. And um, yeah, the Northern Reddies are looking like they're, they're nice horses. Yeah, very excited. And Robbie, to justify Colt, that's looking pretty smart and trialed this morning, came from Melbourne Premier 2, but we didn't actually buy him there. We no, waited a little longer to make sure that once again to cut down our chance. Yeah, no, he went really well this morning because he's, uh, his strength um, is his strength. You know, he looks a, a, a really strong horse that, uh, that will just get better as, as he goes up in distance. And, you know, that for his first jump out this morning over 800 metres, he, he went really, really well. So um, we're, we're very happy with what we see of him. So we're looking forward to him um, learning. He's done his first time this morning. So once he has a bit of practice, he's, he's coming along really well. Yep, and I've just got a question here from Paul Baker. Um, he's in a horse that got gilded recently and wasn't playing up or getting heavy. It seems many, many people do tend to geld them regardless. So um, his thoughts were buying fillies, but obviously in terms of, I guess there's a phrase, they're priced to be a gelding. Could you sort of go on about how that might work. So they're not bred to be a stallion. There's more likelihood that you would geld them than if they're bred to be a stallion. So, for example, if NMO started to play up, I assume they wouldn't geld him. No. So? No, they wouldn't geld uh, him because he's, he's got the credentials on the board. So, I mean, you might just need – yeah, the question, I guess, if you just expand a little bit more on it, I guess. Expand on Paul's, Paul's question, they're, they're priced to be a gelding. No, I, I think what he's trying to say is what he's trying to say is do we geld regardless of their behavior? No. No, you don't geld them. You don't geld on just just for the hell of it. I mean, if the horse is yeah. quiet, um, I think Matt would agree with this and he can have a say after me. You you geld if a horse loses form, there's no point in them staying a colt because there's there's a lot of cults that people will not send a mare to because there's so many stands. So you've got to be a group. You've got to pretty much be a group one winner before they warrant going to start anyway. So if they're not going to be in that category, there's really not a lot of point in them being a stay in. So if they're really quiet, some of them keep them a stay in. We, we've had some horses stay a stay in, you know, for quite some time. Uh, most horses become naughty. So that's why the first reason why trainers geld them or they're too heavy or both because when they get too heavy too much pound per square inch on their legs so it's hard to keep them sound um and price to be a gelding is probably best explained with the prize money on offer these days a lot of geldings can win quite a few hundreds of thousands of dollars if they stay sound and have ability so when you're paying, if you pay 150000 or something for a horse at a sales of 200000 with all these bonus series now and Vobus and everything like that, you can easily, if you get the right horse, you can easily rack up three, four, five hundred thousand 500000 with the gelding going through the, through the classes these days. So you don't have to try for the jackpot and get a stay in and end up with a naughty one that learns bad habits and doesn't win or becomes unsound and never fires because of injury, then you've lost everything. Is that fair, Matt? Yeah, and the other part of the, the question or, or the statement was that he was maybe thinking of buying fillies. Um, I wouldn't be put off buying Colts just because the majority of them land up in Geldings because it doesn't mean that uh, they're not going to be successful. They're going to still win a lot of races, and Geldings can race till they like the age of nature strip, you know, whereas the fillies is always, the breeding barn is always calling. So uh, there are positives to having geldings as well. You can sell them to Hong Kong, you know, there's, there's lots of positives. So don't be put off by uh, the fact that, you know, a couple of your cults have been gelded. Yeah, I think if, if you think about geldings, um, I mean, how Borson, uh, nature strips, the obvious one, um, so C Bond, I think that has has an incredible amount of prize money and is sort of after always, he got gelded though. After he got gelded. After he got gelded, yeah. So yeah. it's a good example of gelding a horse and prolonging their career and giving them a chance. You know, imagine but, imagine if he gelded you, Corey, you'd have a long career. I would, I would. Speaking of geldings, Matt, and the gem for hail, you might. So he's about to be yes. gelded and he's going to come back and win millions. 
Yes, the manhood has already uh, been taken away from him, which is great news because he was starting to get really full of himself and, and do a couple of things wrong. So um, the fact that he was still winning city races and uh, being very cultish is a good sign because if he can just uh, harness that energy a little better, then I think we can have a very successful racing campaign with him as a gelding. Probably one of the things too with him that a lot of people that don't realise he was becoming a, uh, a workplace issue for the staff. You know, we've got a supply a safe workplace for the staff. So, you know, people might say, why would you geld him? He just won a Metro race two starts ago. But when you've got, you know, 570 kilos pushing staff around and potentially causing a work hazard, you have to be mindful of that for your staff as well. So that's what people don't see. No, I think it's a good a good topic, good question, Paul, because I think it's good to to touch on why it might be a benefit to have a to race a gelding, you know. So there are plenty of opportunities there. So Invincible Crown Hobby, which came out of Melbourne Premier, gelded and sold to Hong Kong. Um, and that's a bit of a success story there. Well, we paid thirty thousand for him and he sold for four hundred and after winning two at Mooney Valley. So he was he was a good turnover horse, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, speaking of Melbourne Premier, the benefits, Super Vobus, obviously. Um, and the huge benefit, Matt, I'll touch on you. I know that you really like love this when you first joined the stable and came to the sales, is the marquee. You get you get to it's an opportunity for all of our owners. You can come whether you want to come there and just meet the trainers and have a day out with your family. You can come if you're buying, you know, but you come to the sale. We have our own Griffiths to Cock marquee set up and it's it's basically an opportunity to have a stable day at the at the sale. So Matt, I'll let you sort of explain how it works and how much fun it can be. Yeah, well the sale the sale ground can be a very daunting place for someone that, that walks on the complex and doesn't know anyone, doesn't know where to sit, stand. It can be a very daunting place. So that's why we, we uh, come up with the idea of having a marquee where we invite uh, anyone, if they've got horses or don't have horses in the yard, you know, anyone just can come in with open hands and come and socialize and, and meet some people in racing. And we all share the same passion. So conversation is extremely easy and uh, the beers are cold. The food is good. And uh, it's just good for us to get to know everyone a bit better. And uh, you're in the perfect spot under the trees. You've got access to go look at the horses uh, not far away, access to the, the uh, bidding ring. So um, yeah, come on down, guys. It sh should be another good good event. It's it's uh, went off really really well last year, and I'm really looking forward to it again this year. Yep, and we Robbie, we've got obviously celebrities in yourself and Matthew, but we also have um, big big Papa de Cock here again as well. Yeah, well that's right. He can help us do some work and um, go around to the uh, the yearling sales like we did last year, and we can split up and. Uh, Cut the work in half, meet in the middle, and then um, make sure we cover all 800 horses, and uh, so that we don't miss any horse and don't leave any stone unturned. Um, and that's how we did it, and we come up with some excellent horses uh, last year because we we want to make sure that we cover all bases for our owners, you know. Yeah, and Matt, he's not just here for a holiday; he's here to see you guys, of course. But he he loves going to these sales and went to them previously as well, but. He comes now and he's really there to shop for, for our yard, which is great for us because it means a few extra horses on top of what we we already would get. But it also gives an opportunity for our owners and or anyone on the sales complex to come in and meet him because he does like to park himself in that marquee and have a few beers. Yeah, well, he enjoys the cold one, that's for sure. And my dad's, um, you know, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's got a CV better than most, um, and uh, an eye for a horse that's second to none. So to have him at our at our fingertips and helping us select horses and, and coming to the yard and having a look at the horses in the yard and giving us some advice there is invaluable. So very, very happy. And he's a wealth of knowledge, and, and he's, uh, he's actually a great person to be around just for a chat and a beer. So come, come, and, uh, come and meet him. Yeah, and Robbie, we've got the staff coming along as well. So the girls from the office are going to be there this year. Sharani will obviously be floating around, and it's great to for people to put a name, a uh, face to the names that they 
they have. Obviously, Monique will be there, and I'm sure little Liam will make a guest appearance as the main celebrity de cock of the family. <laughs> um, so it, it really is a good time, and anyone's welcome, friends, family. Uh, you know, it is child friendly in that part of the complex, so you can come to that area as well. So it's a great time, and you know, it's a good platform if you're looking to get involved in your first horse or your 500th horse, really. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, because everyone works so hard in seven day racing that sometimes we don't get a chance to take a breath. So it's great to, uh, especially on that Sunday, to get out there and see the girls in particular. We, we, we're a bit spoiled, the three of us. We get to see everyone at the races. But, uh, you know, Silver, Amy, Monique and Shrani don't always get that upper opportunity. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to see the girls because uh, – and that's a good day to do it. So hopefully everyone can come out and spend the day with us, you know. That's a good segue into girls. Uh, on Friday we have a ladies' luncheon. For, for some lucky ladies that have gone onto that VIP list of ladies and asked to be involved in that. Um, we're looking to buy a horse with Ariane Titmus, and people would have seen that on our socials and probably wondered what did they do with that because they haven't promoted anything about a horse with Ariane Titmus. But Robbie, we've, we've waited for Melbourne Premier for a few reasons. Um, and Inglis duly obliged and gave us that extra million dollar bonus on top of it, which is we weren't really planning on that. But if you can touch on why we've waited. Well, you're probably better at all that promotion stuff than me with all the bonuses. So you can you can do that. Well, I can do that. Yeah. Basically, we we sat down and talked about the ladies bonus. Obviously, Ariane is involved. She's going to be in the ownership with the with the ladies. Um, she's already in Typhoon and Titmus, as we know. Um, and we thought it would be a great way to buy a horse and get the ladies bonus um, through Inglis, which is, you know, they've got extra million dollar ladies bonus. But but the thing is, we can also do the Magic Millions bonus, but the chances of that coming off are probably not as high. And that just on the same, I guess, thought process as everything else, how can we maximise our chance of winning those million dollar bonuses? And if we buy a horse that's Vogue, we can potentially buy in Premier a horse that's Vobus. So you've got the Vobus scheme. They're in the ladies bonus series. You only need 75% female ownership rather than 100%. So straight away, that's easier for us to achieve. And ladies bonus. Inglis race series, restricted. Uh, and then also the new English billion dollar maiden bonus. So you you actually have four different bonus series that you can go after by having the lady syndicate buying at this sale. So when we told Ariane Titmus that, she said, you know, I don't mind winning money on horses, so <laughs> I'm in. So I'll tell you what, that picture there that day, I was shitting myself. I was worried that. Fife and Titmus was going to bowl over Ariane and the superstar was going to get hurt. I was hanging on to the other side, making sure she didn't get, uh, that I don't want to be responsible for the superstar getting uh, injured at the races. No. It's interesting. Mean, she was... meantime, meantime, she's actually got a horse background. I know, but still, she didn't have the right shoes on to move quickly. And I thought, geez, if she gets yeah. hurt, she's not. But she should still, still beat you in a sprint with those shoes on. Oh, of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> of course you would, but I just didn't want it on my watch. I should have had you doing that that day. I'd be my responsibility. <laughs> no, no, she follows very closely. So she's in Thailand at the moment, and obviously she's coming in to, to a live cross for the the ladies syndicate um, uh, on Friday, and and she she said so she was online doing i noticed she was online so our griffiths to cop page clicked on a thing that she was doing online with one of the other swimmers over there and it was a live cross and just like on here you can see who logs in and she says oh griffiths to cop racing they look after my little girl and then started talking to the to her swimming crowd about typhoon titmus so you know she's very proud of her and can't wait to get involved in another one and if there are ladies out there that are interested in being involved who don't know what's happening and would like to know, just contact me. We can, we can sort that out. But also just rock up at Melbourne Premier. Everyone's welcome and 
will be buying a ladies horse. All right, stable update, recent runners, upcoming runners, two year old. Let's go with the trialers this morning. Matt, clock strikes, he was pretty good. He's a bit of a trial champion. So is he gonna bring it to the races? Yeah, we hope so, Corey. He's had some time off uh, between between campaigns and he looks to have uh, matured very well. So let's hope let's hope that's going to translate into a more uh, genuine campaign with him. He was very impressive once again this morning, and um, yeah, I like the way he's going. Yeah, and Robbie, a few big name horses that are making returns. You've got King Magnus, you've got Typhoon Titmus, uh, off the top of my head, coming back in. Um, any others of note coming back in that we haven't seen for a while, and people might be interested in knowing what's happening. King Magnus, um, we've decided to put his program back until he'll target the Winter Championship. Um, he injured his legs last uh, Anzac Day there. Um, so we don't, Matt and I discussed with the veterinary team that we don't want to run him on firm ground. Uh, not, this, not this time around. So we're going to run him when the ground softens up a little bit. So he's going very well, but he, we just... Through management reasons, we're just going to wait a little bit. Typhoon Titmus, um, she's going to look at that same sort of late season, end of season, three-year-old races, and then concentrate on the early season um, mares events. Um, so she won't she won't look at anything uh, until then. She's doing some dressage training at the moment, so that that answers those two. What's your next question? Uh, just other horses like that that are returning. So let's go Hal Borson. What's Big Hal doing? He's uh, aiming towards potentially the Goodwood Handicap. Uh, how he gets there depends. He, he's got a little bit of arthritis these days. Um, his vet test after his um, standish come up quite uh, good. We we're happy with all the vet tests. But he just had a troubled uh, preparation with all the all the wet weather and uh, he had a lot of mucus and everything like that, which was well documented when we were getting interviewed about his run. So I played a bit of havoc with him. So if he has no complications, you could see him in the Goodwood uh, or the straight six series in the winter or nothing. If he has complications, he would just miss everything and concentrate on the spring program that he goes in each and every year. But all the x-rays that uh, took place say that he's up for another another year, um, providing all that mucus and stuff doesn't stand in the way. Yeah, and Matt, the uh, Oaks and uh, Derby prospect, so we've got Let's Be Frank Baby. Um, she'll come back after running in the Oaks. Um, what else have we got that's coming back? We've got Yaki Ishi. He hasn't hit the hit the track yet, so they're all they're both returning. Yeah, Let's Be Frank Baby and Yaki Ishi are probably about a week or two off uh, trialling. Let's be frank, baby, obviously going down the route of uh, towards Adelaide Oaks and the Phillies Classic. It is a couple of weeks after that as well. So uh, she looks like she's developed well with her time off. We gave her a bit of extra time off because she was actually quite immature during the spring. So she had a good two months off. Uh, Yaki, he also had a long holiday and uh, his temperament seems to have uh, come good. He had obviously temper issues and uh, he's really doing well at the moment. He's also about a week off. Uh, Trialing, um, then Dream Hour, he's, he's run third um, during the carnival in the 1800 race uh, for three-year-olds during the on Mobile Cup Day. And uh, he's already had a trial. He trialed last week Monday, trialed Super. He'll trial next Monday, and then he'll start racing the uh, middle of March. So a couple of the uh, young three-year-olds coming through are developing really well, and I think we'll have a good uh, late autumn for sure. Yeah, that was my next question, Robbie. The three-year, obviously, a lot of our owners will be looking at their two-year-olds that are, and waiting. You know, when are they going to have a trial? When are they going to run? And it's all starting to happen for them now, which is great. But we also have a few unraced three-year-olds that were given that extra time, um, like Queen of Moa, uh, you know, you know, or lightly raced clock strikes. Those types of horses, the Highland Real filly. Um, which uh, unraced three-year-olds at the moment or lightly raced three-year-olds are you excited about? Well, Queen of Moa has always uh, impressed us, um, but she's always continued to grow. She's quite a big, strong filly now, and we haven't really um, put her under any real pressure because of her her growth, but um, she's always impressed us on the track. So we, uh, we'd like to think that she'll 
our patients will be rewarded there. Um, as you pointed out, clock strikes is one that's uh, always been impressive on the track and we think that he'll come through. Kerensky's always given us a few issues at the barriers, but uh, um, he's, he trolled up well last week and he's only had the one run for a placing. So he's he's one that could um, all of a sudden uh, come good for us. So, you know, there's a few there that um, that we, we've been very patient with and, um, you know, there's Mr Magnus as well, Hal Orson's brother. And, yeah, so there's a few there that, you know, and even a lot of the two-year-olds we haven't put under much pressure either. So we're better off um, getting them there when they're ready rather than pushing them along and, and uh, putting them under pressure, you know. Yeah, and which two-year-olds will we see? I know a lot of we've got for – for, I'm not sure how many owners are in the Merchant Navy binocular, but he seems to be a, an extremely popular horse. So if he can come out and be a nice miler, he might be an all-star mile type because he's quite popular with our owners. Um, how's he going? He's um, – well, he's growing as well. So when they're growing and developing um, – how far they get. He's a nice horse. He breezed up pretty quickly last time. He's got very, very strong, very heavy as he's developing now. So we're just about to um, speed, him, speed him along. Um, so um, over the next few weeks, we'll determine his immediate future um, as to where he's at. So this is where we x-ray our young horses when they're going through this phase to make sure their bone structure is ready for the next levels of activity. Um, and if the vets give us a green light, full steam ahead. And if not, we go back to the paddock and let them develop. So that's that's why we have to be patient with our young horses because that's where they go through all these changes, you know. Yeah. So there is a host of two-year-olds, for example, that we talked about earlier that came in, did a prep, and then popped back out. So there's Zoom, the Zoom star filly. Yep. Um, there's the Autumn Sun Colt, which trialed up really well and then went out. There's Akachita, the grunt that we spoke about. Sarasana is going out now. Um, how long did it? So basically, they they don't. So they all came in and you sort of loosely look at Blue Diamond timing. And then if they don't run into Blue Diamond, what's the next sort of target for those guys? Or does that vary? It varies because you put the you know, as I was saying earlier, 2,000 green bottles sat on the wall for the diamond, 16 stand up, you know. Um, so every trainer, ownership group, expectation group have the same goals. We all want to win the blue diamond and the golden slipper. Um, but only, you know, 16 or so get there. And it's it's all for the same reasons that not every horse's growth pattern is going to fit those dates, you know. Exercise creates growth because the speed and the exercise program creates stimulus. It's no different to when we're young, teenagers, you start, you know, exercising, playing sport, going to school. Next minute, your pants are halfway up your leg, you're growing, you know, and the, the young horses are the same. So when you bring them into training, they go for a growth spurt and it actually forces them back out to the paddock. So all of these young horses have trolled beautifully. Zoomed, um, the Star Spangled Banner filly, I forget the race name now, Autumn Storm. Um, all of those horses have trolled really well. Um, the Piero filly, the, the PC bred out of divine quality, all of those horses have trolled up super and, and half of them are sitting in the paddock. Autumn Storm's gone to do some dressage today, um, you know, because now that they've had a stimulus, they're all growing at different rates. Sarasana had a run and one and a fourth. Uh, celestial storms run the other day so they're all at different stages now Akachita nearly got there so over the from now till race day they're all going to go through different stages um, and that's what Matt and I and the veterinary team and so on will determine when they go and how they go depending on how they react to training so I know it's a long long answer but that's what mother nature does from now on yeah no so I mean I know that we we quite often ask similar questions mm. um, but I know that at this time of year a lot of people start to ask about their two-year-olds because they you know it's, it's an exciting time of the year the first group ones are starting to come around mm. um, you know you had the the, the black cabinet the first basically big meeting at Flemington came around so it's the most exciting time for owners um, and then the sales uh, sale season's underway so they might be buying their first yearling Mm. Um, so you know it's never been a better time to be in racing at the moment. But if we can, if we can make sure everyone knows 
the process and even better. I've just launched a poll there, guys, so if everyone can have a look there. Um, I've popped my trapeze artist cap on because I think <laughs> we need we need to get one of those. So they've been hard to get, haven't they? They have been. One thing I will say about the babies, though, Matt and I continue to get out of bed early because they're all exciting us. So we're, we're, we're happy with what we see. We just have to wait on Mother Nature. Yeah. I'll end that poll there. And I've got another poll for English Premier. I'll pop this poll up here now. So just about the marquee to see who's been there and who hasn't. Um, Matt, we almost had our first runner overseas as well, so we might touch on that. We we had a different little idea. Um, we just did a, um, we did two, three different things. We got a yearling from the UK, which we brought down, which is a bit of Oz, and he's obviously doing quite well, and um, he's going along nicely. We bought we also bought two fillies in the UK, left them there for their two year old season, and then they'll come here afterwards, depending on how they go. Just for little projects that we had, and we almost had our first runner, but she's just been mm. set back a couple of weeks. Yeah, it was quite exciting because uh, she's in training with Jamie Osborne. And uh, he was uh, mentioning that he thought she had a lot of ability. He's given her a lot of time and she was due to run on Wednesday. And then uh, on Monday, she just had a little bit of soreness. So again, one of those, uh, one of those things with when you're working with flesh and blood and uh, young horses, they get a little bit of soreness from time to time. So anyway, we're willing to still be more patient because she looks like she can run a bit. And uh, she's by Harry's Angel out of uh, the family of Agugu. So an exciting purchase. If she can um, develop into a good racehorse, she'll be worth a fair bit of money. And uh, so the plan with her is hopefully if she can be successful in a, you know, first two or three career starts and show some promising ability, then we will export her to Australia and she will come home to Cranbourne and we'll attack the Australian racing with her. So Hopefully it's a success because we would uh, like to continue doing these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and speaking of initiatives, Paul's just commented, Robbie, saying we will be interesting to see if Magic Millions do something to compete with the maiden announcement. Um, but it also takes me to, obviously, we can't announce anything yet. Robbie, we've been throwing around a few ideas to see if we can have our own little Griffiths to Cock racing bonus, which we're hoping by the time English Premier comes around, we might have quite a large announcement on that, which will incentivise people not only to race for the English bonuses, the Magic Millions bonuses and everything else, but actually a little bonus to race with us. Yeah, well, that's what we're working on, but we we probably jump in the gun there, aren't we, Corey? You get excited there. Oh, we, we, I am quite excited about it. If, yeah. if we well, we are trying to work on trying to do something similar, but we uh, Corey won't come to the party, he won't cop up any money. So he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trying well, to do that though. It'd be good if we could, we good if we could sort of do a similar bonus in our stable to try and boost the prize money again for horses that we have. So, uh, so for our watch, class of watch the space. <laughs> Watch this space. That's what the saying goes, isn't it? Watch this space. Watch, Watch this space. space. I mean, we definitely will have some sort of bonus. It's just we're mm -hmm. we're aiming for the we're aiming for the stars, and if we fall short, we'll we'll still get to the sky. But mm -hmm. um, we're we're definitely going to do something. But we're we're aiming big. So let's see. If we if we can don't get it there. We might call it the Armstrong approach. He got to the moon, so maybe something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, we've, we've not, we may have bitten off more than we can chew, but we're having a good crack when we're, we're, we're chewing we're this. So we are, yeah. So anyway, guys, thank you very much for for joining us again. Uh, I think that's all. Getting back, we didn't answer Paul's question. I reckon Magic Millions will have to, they'll be under pressure to do something there. You'd think so. You would think well, they'd so. They'd have to be, because they're going to lose, they're going to have to, it'll have to put them under pressure because that's an outstanding Bonus series, I reckon, what English have done. Yeah. Yeah. And you add that to Vobus or Bob's. Well, you add it to Vobus or like even in our state there, like you can run in a maiden now for 37, right? Plus Vobus is 10, plus the goal is 20, so 67. If you get it under that new uh, boost, 67, you can run for 97. You add 100, you're running for 200 grand. Yeah. You 200 know, like, grand for a maiden. For a maiden. 
you know, so you run to 200 grand. So one of like that, what's that zoo saying, Philly, 135 or something? You know, if you win to wins a maiden, if you run a couple of seconds and thirds and then win your maiden, you're going to amass a lot of money and that's just to come out of your maiden grade. Yeah. The industry certainly, I mean, I know it's hard to understand for those out of it, but for all of you guys that are are in so far, it's, 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 it's all geared around people getting at least a return on investment, whether it's, um, you know, if you get lucky, you could, you could basically win the lotto, but if you um even if you don't there's an opportunity there to to double your money triple your money quadruple your money in the first few starts now so but to have a self-sustainable entertainment package racing i mean there's no other there's not nothing like it else in the world really so i mean that's that's very smart of english to do that so i reckon magic means are going to have to be they're going to have to put something similar on rather than just the race day yeah it is off, it is off topic, but it's probably the only industry, the only sport in the world, and I know that's sort of come up with the Asian Racing Conference and engagement and everything else, but it's the only sport in the world where you can be close and touch and feel the the athletes and the the celebrities. You know, like you go to any sport, any other sporting environment, you go, you get a ticket, you go there and you watch generally. So, yeah, absolutely. You don't get alone in terms of what it gets. Yeah. So, anyway, but right, reaching to the converted on here. Correct. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank See you, you very guys. much. All right. Bye. See you. Sales. Yep. Yeah.